I was one of the most bullied kids at Largemont Elementary. And even after Mr. Bailey, my fifth grade teacher, would call me a faggot, a sissy, a wussy, and so on, in front of the whole class, Larchmont put me with him again in sixth grade, even though there was an alternative. When it comes to how I was bullied by other kids, some of it was my own fault, because I was going with what Sunday school would teach, what other teachers would teach, what counselors would teach, what my mother would teach, and that's to become a tattletale, and that's not the right answer. One time when one of the bullies wanted me to basically cower down to him and carry myself in a way as if I was really scared, I didn't, and he punched me in the lip, and my tooth went all the way through it, right above my lip right here. And that's why I, one of the main reasons why I don't like not having a mustache, because you can see the scar. And that was one of the times where the school enacted corporal punishment. But they punished both the bullies and myself because, well, in their eyes, you know, well, I was involved, so I deserved to get punished as well. Good old Mr. Swint, who everyone feared, even the other staff. So comes his paddle with all the holes in it. You get those three swats. There was a somewhat satisfying memory, though, because I sat there with a slight grin on my face while the two bullies that got swatted were bawling their eyes out. Of course, that didn't help things later on, but, you know, that was the last year I was going to be there and have to worry about that anymore, and my mother did everything she could to be able to get me to go to an out-of-district school for middle school and eventually high school, where in high school I had to take horticulture and agriculture as my main science classes, since that was one of the only schools that offered those things, so I had to sort of feign interest in those things so I could go to an out-of-district school. Now, granted, those classes were interesting, but I do wish I would have had regular science classes. In middle school and high school, I learned a lot more about how to defend myself, but honestly, some of the main things that got me out of this sort of thing was the fact that people knew me as being very musical. For instance, every year, I would sing uh, with a mic solo at pep assemblies, and uh, the last year, it was even one of my own songs, so, you know, that really helped me. I graduated high school in 1991. I thought I would see the last of any sort of bullying mindset, but by the time the late 90s came around and I started messing with multiplayer first-person shooters, I started to find that kind of culture once again. By 2003, I started kind of losing interest in a lot of these online games, online multiplayer first-person shooter games. It's a little different in RPGs, but... But I lost interest because of how strong the bullying culture was in it. I'm just not into dealing with that shit past childhood. We shouldn't have to deal with that shit past childhood, because it's childish behavior. I mean, I still play the games once in a while, and I still do once in a while even today. It's not that enticing, really. Unfortunately, a bullying kind of culture is very prevalent in the gaming community. More so in first-person shooters, but it does exist outside of that as well. You know, in the chat logs, faggot this, wussy that, you're worthless. And then if they find out that there's a woman playing the game, they'll incessantly tell her about her body, or ask her about, about her body, or if she starts kicking their asses, they'll say things like, oh, well, well, that was pretty good for a woman. It's like, all right. I mean, I understand that maybe they're not used to seeing women play games or, or whatever, but that excuse only lasts for so long, you know? I've participated on political forums since the BBS days of the late 80s, and they've always been very well moderated. You can have a discussion about just about any subject, and it's going to be a reasonable discussion. It's going to sound like adults having a discussion. It's always great to have that kind of platform available. By 2003, forum software had become pretty standardized and pretty refined, and there were tons and tons of choices of places that you could go. The forums I always kept away from were the ones that had no moderation at all, or very little moderation, or they only moderate one side while the other side gets free reign. 
That sort of shit always pissed me off. And on the forums that there wasn't really any moderation at all, there was no reasonable conversation to be had. Most of the time it was just more of this element of people acting like what you find on multiplayer games, in the chat log, or in elementary school on the playground. But the whole time, generally the ones who do the most insulting of people, the ones who acted the most childish as far as having to insult people all the time, even if they had good points they'd bring up otherwise, were coming from right-wingers. Because that's just how it works. Left-wingers like to moderate through rules. Right-wingers like to moderate through intimidation and through making people feel like shit about themselves. Then you have those on the left that will not really want to continue a conversation and they'll just say words like racist, homophobe, sexist, and act like that's like an excuse to stop having a conversation. That of course happened too. But the majority of the major insults have always come from the right. And if they didn't come from the right, if, if, it, if it was something that was still not beneficial to the conversation that came from the right, then it's one of those presuppositionalist type of arguments and what are you supposed to do about that, right? Eventually came MySpace, and that was fun for a while, but we all know what happened with the demise of that. Then came 4chan, which had some possibilities, but it got known how much bullying there was going on there, and I really didn't want to participate in that. I stayed away from it like the plague, because I know that there's not going to be any reasonable discussion there. And then of course came YouTube before Google bought it out. It was originally a video social networking site. And then of course Google bought it out and everything was focused on how they could make money off of it. Eventually, one by one, Google destroyed most of the social networking functions from the site. And as social networking on YouTube decreased, that bullying culture that you find in multiplayer uh, first-person shooters, and in elementary school, and on 4chan, increased. Every year it seems that the bullying culture on YouTube doubles. I don't know if it's really that high, but it sure seems that way. And this is because nothing has ever been done about this the entire time YouTube has been in existence. It's over 10 years of no moderation, or really virtually no moderation. And when there is some sort of moderation, a bunch of people will start foolishly talking about their First Amendment rights, which doesn't apply to a company's website. And this year, it's to the point where we have people actually trying to argue that someone's real name is not a personal identifier, even though it's required for a driver's license, a job application, uh, just about anything that you need to identify yourself with. Your name is the most important thing. But these people try to act like dock dropping someone's real name when they're trying to be anonymous can't possibly have any negative side effects. And if it does, well, you know, it's their fault or, or something like that, right? And then there's all the people who try to say that words can't hurt people if they're said online. And people try to claim that there's no such thing as online bullying because, well, to use an analogy, the sky really isn't blue. Technically, it's just an illusion and blah 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 fucking blah. And that if a firecracker goes off next to your ear and you say, well, that was really loud, they'll say, well, technically that wasn't really loud, and they'll list, you know, all these potentially millions of things that are much louder. And so therefore, the firecracker that just went off next to your ear wasn't really loud at all. This is the kind of logic bending that some of these right-wingers will do to promote their right-wing ideology, while they pose as being left-wingers. It's now to the point where about a quarter of the comments, at least a quarter of the comments that you see on almost any given video, are from people of that bullying culture, where pure insults and starting off as insults, not building into insults, but just flat out starting off as insults, vapid insults, and have literally nothing to do with critiquing someone's position. Because sometimes it's a music video. I mean, it's on just about every type of video. But somehow, the people that do this try to claim that those are their, their actual valid opinions. And if you delete those insults, they'll claim that you're violating their First Amendment rights. The same thing has occurred on Twitter and Tumblr. 
It sometimes occurs on Facebook as well, but Facebook is much more heavily moderated than most of the other platforms. And this is why so many people on the right are crying and, and pleading that, oh, Facebook is, is not letting us speak our minds. Because, as I said, left-wingers tend to moderate through rules, and right-wingers tend to moderate through insulting people and trying to make people feel like shit about themselves. Sometimes in the name of tough love, or some other convoluted methodology. So, let's look back at when people who have the SJW pejorative thrown at them no longer care whether they're offending people. When they no longer care about regularly going out of their way to offend those who fit the largest demographic. So what came first? The insults towards straight cis white males? Or insults towards those who are trying to promote diversity or trying to promote the idea of us treating each other decently for a change? I think that's a good question. Once the neophobic alt-right mindset began to take hold and liberals were being sucked into their void, then the social justice warriors started getting really, really nasty. And they stopped caring about whether they offend people who just happen to fit the demographics of those who constantly hurl insults at them. The ones constantly throwing pejoratives at them. I mean, let's face it, a lot of the SJWs did grow a thicker skin. That's part of what being mean to the demographic that has been mean to them is all about. You know, a thicker skin. Like Live Life 8072 making an hour-long video of insults towards someone who just pointed out that he's become a bit more mean over the years. So what is a social justice warrior? Well, the earliest reference I can find of the term social justice warrior was from a 1995 novel by Tim Dugdale, and it was used in a very positive way. It was used in a way that has absolutely nothing to do with how it's used now or at least mostly nothing to do with how it's used now. It was by 2011 that Social Justice Warrior pretty much primarily became a pejorative. By that time, it got used as a snarl word to be used to completely dismiss the arguments of liberals and progressives, often to dismiss the entire notion of the concept of social justice whatsoever. And other usage of the phrase is used to describe people who put themselves under the banner of social justice to be a complete and total cunt. So what came first, the cunts or the bullies? Well, neophobia, which is the fear of new ideas or new concepts or new ways of looking at things, which has been a part of the human psyche since our recorded history. Not with everyone. I mean, there have always been the neophobes, there have always been the neophiles. New ideas are scary, they make people nervous, and with that fear sometimes comes hatred and anger. And yes, I totally, totally get that not all new ideas are good. Sometimes they downright suck. Some old ideas are awesome. I get that. 4chan was established in 2003, and that's where a lot of this stuff started really getting kick-started. Multiplayer online gaming culture became quite established in the late 90s. Republicans and right-wing neophobes have been posing as the left for a countless number of years. And attempts for right-wingers to convert left-wingers to their ideology and the other way around has been existing always since humanity. <laughs> and online bullying has existed in all of the places where people can make comments in an unmoderated way. I mean, and that's been since the internet became a thing. So, when did those who people consider social justice warriors, or people who claim that they stand for social justice, start to not care about whether they offend people of the majority demographic, and sometimes get their jollies off of it? Well, that would probably be in 2011. So since we're there, let me ask you something. If you are a straight, white, cisgender male, then what systemic issues are brought against your demographic that make your life miserable? Does it make your life shitty when other demographics talk about 
shitty things that are done to them on a systemic level? Does gay marriage make your straight marriage less significant? Do protections against discrimination of women in the workplace make your workplace a terrible place to be? Does talking about how black people are treated by police nullify any discussion of how white people are treated by police? Does prejudice and negative attitudes towards trans people cause prejudice and negative attitudes towards cis people? Or is it generally only when cis people blow a huge gasket about people talking about what trans people go through that you start seeing the word cisgender used as a pejorative? If there are systemic issues that you as a cisgender straight white male go through, what are they besides feeling threatened by other demographics talking about systemic issues that they're going through? I get that there are legal issues when it comes to child rearing and child support, but what else? It can't be because there aren't very many shelters for battered men. Because the ones who talk the most about being so angry about other demographics discussing things that they're going through, men are supposed to acquire a thicker skin because supposedly there's no such thing as toxic forms of masculinity. So what are these issues that straight cisgender white males experience on a systemic level? Let me guess, we shouldn't discuss demographics because people are people and you like everything to stay the same. Oh, you don't want everything to stay the same? Okay, what do you want changed and how should we go about changing those things? Any ideas? Or are you going to just say that some people suck and life sucks and everyone should just grow a thicker skin because in actuality you don't really want anything to change but you don't want the label of being someone who doesn't want anything to change? Is that it? Or to make an analogy, are you going to do the equivalent of critiquing a video game by saying, this game sucks, it needs to be improved, and leave it as that because, well, giving specifics as to what is actually wrong with it would mean that you're giving into an ideology because all problems are supposed to be the same or equal because you're an egalitarian and all games matter. Or is it something else? If it's something else, then please explain in the comments. Thanks.